Thank you, program directors, Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, Minister Maite Nkwana Mashabane, Ministers who are here present, including those that some of you may have thought are not here, like the Minister of Health is definitely here. He could never miss a summit like this. And Deputy Ministers, the Speaker of our National Assembly, Ms. Nosiviwe Mapisa Ngakula, the First Lady of Namibia, Mayor Monica Gengos, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Baroness Patricia Scotland, representatives of the judiciary who are here with us and the magistracy, the premiers who have taken time of their very busy schedule to be here amongst us as well, and MECs who are also here, representatives and leaders of various civil society formations, representatives of interfaith community who are also here, and representatives of the diplomatic community who are here representing various countries that are our friends around the world and also representing certain continents that are here and representatives of uh, local and international donor organizations that continue to support our work as a nation through civil society organizations as well as our work in government. Representatives of international bodies such as the UN, and other related organizations that we work with on an ongoing basis, and business representatives who are also here and who continue to support the work that we do, and fellow South Africans. I'd like to start off by saying I very much appreciated the earlier session which gave many of you a platform and an opportunity to raise a number of questions as well as concerns. The questions that you have raised, some of which have been responded to and some of which will be responded to, as was earlier said by our program directors during the various other segments of this whole summit. And even those that were directed at me, uh, where a number of you kept saying, Mr. President, this, Mr. President, that, Mr. President, this, uh, I wish you could be president so that I can say the same to you. <laughs> even those that I may not be able to touch on in my input now, will also be responded to. I just want you to know that we really appreciate and welcome the remarks, the questions, concerns, as well as complaints that were raised here. Some of which were raised at high pitch level voices and some of which people were stamping their feet on the ground uh, we appreciate and accept and embrace all that. 
We are a government that listens. When our people speak, we do listen. We may not be able to do everything that you all have articulated, but as you will see through what I am going to put before you, we are at work. We're meeting here at this second summit on gender-based violence and femicide, as was said, exactly four years to the day since we made a pledge, a pledge that we made to each other to work together to end violence that men, the men of our country, perpetrate against women and children in South Africa. It was at the first presidential summit on GBV and femicide in 2018 that we collectively made a firm commitment to the nation to undertake a comprehensive, effective, united response to gender-based violence and femicide. We agreed then that we would develop a national strategic plan to guide our national response, to coordinate the various sectors involved in the fight against gender-based violence. It was also aimed at strengthening the government's response, and may I say much more than just government, but the state's response, and to align the efforts of government as well as the private sector and civil society. We decided to embark on a number of interventions to deal with the scourge of gender-based violence and femicide in our country, a scourge which, as some of you have correctly said, I dubbed, I dubbed the second pandemic because during COVID, gender-based violence reared its head in a most ugly way, and I dubbed it the second pandemic. And you are right in saying we should now see this as the first pandemic, as the first pandemic now, because it continues, it continues to destroy the lives of the women and children of our country. They continue to be raped, they continue to be violated, and they continue to be killed. Then the first step that we came up with was to develop a gender-based violence and femicide emergency response action plan in 2019. I then requested Parliament's presiding officers to call a special joint sitting of both houses of Parliament to not only announce the plan, but to have the plan discussed and debated. The plan was embraced by members of parliament representing all political parties. In many ways, this was a significant moment for us in that gender-based violence and femicide was seen as a non-partisan matter on which all political parties demonstrated their preparedness to act together. This was followed by the release in April 2020 of the National Strategic Plan, a plan that you yourselves had carefully crafted and put together. And this is what gave me a great deal of joy and pride that this was not a government plan, but it was a civil society driven and drafted plan. Yet, despite our efforts, violence against women and children continues unabated in our country. 
data from the South African Police Service shows that sexual offenses and rape increased by 13 percent between 2017 stroke 2018 and 2020-2022. Between the first quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022, there was a 52 percent increase in the murder of women and a 46 percent increase in the number of children who were murdered. Not a day goes by without a story in our newspapers, on television, and online platforms about a woman or a child that has, been, that has lost their life or been abused in the most horrendous manner. Since the rape and murder of 19-year-old Uyinene Mkhechan in 2019, that sparked mass marches across the country. There have been so many more women that have been killed at the hands of men. Since then, the nation has been horrified by the brutal violence that took the lives of Tsekhofa Atsopule, Nosikele Mtembeni, Hilary Gadi, Namsam Twa, Dimpo Sikelenge, and many other women. Innocents like Asitandile Same, Simolojo Luchabeng, Tanzi van Weyck and Reagan Hansi have fallen victims to heartless men and criminals. Just as the country was reeling from the news of a gang rape of a group of women in Krugersdorp, we were confronted with the news of the murder of a four-year-old little Bukhabo Po who was dismembered and her body parts thrown into a field. Just as babies are not being spared, even the elderly have become targets of violent men in our country. We have in recent times seen a spate of rapes and killings of elderly women, our mothers and our grandmothers, that are meant to be respected and treated with dignity. And this, in many ways, goes totally against the grain of our cultures and traditions as South Africans, that women should be treated with dignity, with respect, and not be violated. These horrors in many ways defy comprehension. There are really no words that we can use to describe them and the horrific manner in which all these murders and these rapes happen. They tell a story about our society that is deeply disturbing. It is a story of a nation that is seemingly at war with itself. But much worse, it is a story of a nation that is at war with the women of its country and the children of its country. These barbaric acts are a shameful indictment on the men of South Africa. It is not women who are responsible for ending such crimes. It is men who are responsible and who must take responsibility to bring violence, rapes, and murder against women. They are the ones who must act. 
As a society, ending violence against women and children cannot be anything but our foremost priority. And you are right in your anger. You are right in the frustration that you were expressing here. That in your view, and indeed in some cases, absolutely correctly so, we are not making it the priority that it should be. Because this is about the lives of our country's women and children. And there can be no greater urgency. And I must say, with humility, we have not demonstrated that great urgency, as you were saying. And I say this with humility, with admission as well, we could have and we should be doing much better than we are. That is why all of us who are attending this summit must therefore be focused on action and results. The reason I appreciate your coming to this summit and the reason I appreciate what you were articulating, very clear messages, is that you as civil society must insist that we should be accountable to you. You are the citizens of our country, and where we fail and falter, you must call us out. Where we let you down, you must speak out, as you were speaking out earlier this morning. This I embrace with my two arms or two hands, and I'm grateful that we have a very active citizenry and civil society organs or, form or formations that even as we are gathered here, you will express your views without any fear or favor and even call me out as your president. I appreciate that. That is why it's important, therefore, to do what my two sisters sitting here were saying. Let us use this summit as a forum, as a platform, and an opportunity where we can come up with solutions. Some progress has been made, as it was admitted, but much more still needs to be done. So having called the first summit and this summit, and even if not everything has been done and achieved, let us not hold back from insisting that I, as president, and the ministers must be accountable. We must be able to give you answers on the issues that you raise. We also need to be critical about those areas of the National Strategic Plan in which there has been little or no progress. And I'd like you to spend time going through all the pillars and look at them introspectively and where we have faltered and where we have not taken action, you must hold us accountable. We need practical plans to correct shortcomings and areas of weakness. Yes, you do need to ask why was the council not set up? And you deserve answers to that. There are answers, but you need clearer answers so that you can understand clearly, so that that lapse should not happen again. The summit must look at what is working and what is not working, and what is needed to make a difference. We are in this journey together. And so therefore, 
we must make the national strategic plan work because it is our creation and we cannot ditch it. We must make sure that it works. Drafting this national strategic plan was a de defining moment for our country when we were engulfed by rising incidents of gender-based violence. So therefore, this plan of ours must be made to work. So this is a summit of accountability. This second presidential summit is for us to assess progress in fulfilling the commitments we made at the first summit in 2018 and in implementing the National Strategic Plan. What we have assessed throughout this process is the importance of a collaborative, coordinated approach towards combating gender-based violence. We need to plan together, implement together, and account together. We owe this to the women of our country. We owe it to all who have been victims also of the scourge of gender-based violence, including their families and their loved ones. The families of these young women whose names I read are also looking at how we are going to deal with the issues that continue to haunt them as families and how we are going to come up with practical solutions. In the end, we owe it to the people of South Africa because this scourge affects all of us. It affects not only women, it affects the men of our country and all of us. The actions we take now will determine whether this crime forever remains a feature of our national life or whether we can say we are the generation that has come to grips with gender-based violence and we are also the generation that has ended it. One of the great successes of our effort to fight gender-based violence is the extent to which social partners have rallied together around the National Strategic Plan. The presence here today of such a broad range of civil society organizations, public bodies, social formation is a testament to this. We are grateful to all those people from across society who have been involved throughout all the stages of the formulation of the National Strategic Plan and have guided its implementation. We are further grateful of all the working groups co-chaired by government and civil society representatives that have been working tirelessly to drive the implementation of the NSP. To ensure that the issue of gender-based violence receives the highest attention, the responsibility for institutionalizing the NSP across all organs of the state was placed in the presidency. An end GBV collective was established as a multi-sectoral structure to drive collaborative implementation. Government departments are required to submit monthly reports to the presidency outlining their respective achievements towards the targets set out in the NSP. Someone did ask, someone did ask, are the reports being presented on a monthly basis, the performance has been sporadic. I must say, it hasn't been complete. And now we will be able to say, I'm going to ensure that the reports on ensuring that actions, interventions on the National Strategic Plan are given on a monthly basis by all is adhered to. Because this is too important. And also to ensure that the interministerial committee that we set up continues to coordinate the implementation of the NSP across government. 
Having set it up, it also needs to be reporting regularly, and the reports have been sporadic as well. The bill that will pave the way for the establishment of the Gender-Based Violence Femicide Council is currently before Parliament. Now, you may ask why, as you did ask, why has it taken so long to have this council established? Just for you to know, I have been personally following this matter and asking why is it taking so long. Professor Shisana can testify to this. Now, the problem is that, yes, government tends to move slowly. Now, some of you said you move very quickly during the COVID pandemic. Yes, indeed we did. And we were armed by a legislation. The Disaster Management Act was able to arm us through the leadership of the Minister of Cocta. We were able, through the law, to set aside a number of considerations because we had a law that enabled us to do so. Now, piloting this act through the various processes, including taking it to NEDLEC, has taken far too long because the council in the end couldn't really be fully set up without the legislative instrument. And now, and this is where my point of humility comes in, and now that it is going through to go to parliament, we will make sure that we move quicker. We have the council set up and the full machinery set up. One of the placards I saw there, something that you've been asking questions about, is about funding. Funding for this whole effort. One of the placards which I liked very much said, fund the fight, fund this fight. Now, I like that placard because it basically means that real money needs to be set aside so that we can fund this fight. What we did do, and my brother who was moderating here asked about the 1.6 billion. The 1.6 billion was what was extracted from the various departments. In a way, we said, top slice your budgets, fund this whole effort, Minist various ministries from health and all of them, they had to set aside money for funding the NSP. Now that we will have a proper council in terms of the law, Treasury will then be able to set aside on a separate basis the money that will fund this fight. So that is going to happen now. We must acknowledge that, as I said, this bill has taken far too long. And I say that with humility, due to a rather long process of consultation. Uh, but we are hopeful that that whole process has, enriched, has been enriched by the ex extensive engagements. And you may ask, we moved very quickly with the laws that I will prob I'll talk about now. We moved very quickly with them and speeded them through because some of them were just really amendments to some of the existing laws. Now, in government, a law, for instance, takes up to three years, three full years before a law is properly on the statute book. But to ensure that a gendered lens is applied to public finances and resource allocation, as I said, in 2019, we adopted a framework on gender response planning, budgeting, monitoring, and evaluation, and auditing. This is in the early stages of implementation, 
and we are working to institutionalize it at all levels of government. I said at the inaugural summit that we would fast track the review of existing laws, as our saying, and policies to ensure that they are more effective at preventing gender-based violence and providing greater support and care for survivors and bringing perpetrators to justice. And in January, and that is the reason why they were fast-tracked, because it was an amendment to existing laws. In January of this year, I was able to sign into law three key pieces of legislation, namely the Criminal Law Sexual Offenses Related Matters Amendment Act, the Criminal and Related Matters Amendment Act, and the Domestic Violence Amendment Act. So these move very quickly. Now these laws afford greater protection to survivors of gender-based violence and ensure that perpetrators, those who perpetrate violence against women and children, are no longer able to use legislative loopholes to evade prosecution. That through these laws, we will be able to catch them and to make sure that they are prosecuted and they are jailed, and if need be, the doors of the jail should be locked forever against such people. Other reforms that will strengthen the fight against gender-based violence include the prevention and combating of hate crimes and hate speech bill that is currently before Parliament. One of you asked about this, and it is now currently before Parliament as Minister Lamola said. The Victim Support Services Bill has been approved by Cabinet and published for public comment. In 2020, we also passed the Cyber Crimes Act, which affords protection against sex crimes like so-called revenge, revenge pornography, threats of sexual violence, threats of uh, blackmail and other acts that disproportionately affect women, especially girls. The Department of Justice and Correctional Services is currently seized with implementing reforms in the criminal justice system to ensure that the system prioritizes survivors and their needs. There has been particular focus on the accessibility and functioning of sexual offenses courts. I'm sitting next to Baroness Scotland here, who used to be a minister in the UK. And she was sharing her own experience in terms of what they did in the UK in dealing with gender-based violence as well. And many of the things that she related are things that we are working on. And she is spreading the message also in the Commonwealth. I'm sure she will speak later and be able to give some, uh, shed some light on what is happening there. So as we move forward with all this, we're finding that we are learning from other countries and we are sort of going over ground that they've either gone on or we are in some cases even leading. Since the last presidential summit, 83 courts have been upgraded into sexual offenses courts. Precisely what she and I were discussing about setting up of special courts that will deal with sexual offenses. We have prioritized support for survivors through adequate sheltering services and one-stop services for victims of trauma. Now, expanding the network of Tutuzela care centers was one of the commitments that we made at the 2018 presidential summit. Since the NSP was adopted, we have opened more new centers around the country. And I would like to see us opening many more. Another centers will be opened in Limpopo later this month. Now, this will add to the increase of Tutuzela care centers 
across the country. And as I said, I want more of these to be opened up because they, could, they, they play a key function. Apart from being places of refuge, as well as being places of support for victims, these centers are proving to be very effective in improving conviction rates. In the last financial year, conviction rate of, as Minister Lamula was saying, of up to 77% was obtained for cases reported at the Tutuzela care centers. It is a phenomenal improvement, a great improvement. It may seem little, but indeed, if you look at it from a historical point of view, we have made an improvement there. But this has been at your instance. This has been because you have been insisting that these Tutuzela centers must be spread around more, they must be properly uh, uh, equipped, and they also there must be staff that will help victims of violence against women. As it stands, out of 52 districts across the country, 45 of our districts have at least one gender-based violence shelter, and 85% of these are funded by the government. And we are pleased that the private sector has come to fund some and indeed a number of non-governmental organizations. And we welcome these other organizations as well, including international bodies. For instance, I was talking to the ambassador uh, earlier from the EU who was, who was telling me that they are spending up to a billion rand assisting various efforts, various efforts that have to deal with many social issues that our country faces, but also on gender-based violence, producing literature, supporting non-governmental organizations. And we must never, we must never disregard that. And that is why South Africa's position in the world is so valuable, because we've got countries that are friendly towards us and who help us, who support us in our efforts of rebuilding our country from the ashes of colonialism and ashes of apartheid misrule as well. We will do more to ensure that the remaining districts in our country without shelters are capacitated. I'd like to see, as I said, more of these shelters in all our districts throughout the country. The Department of Social Development has established a national emergency response team to offer trauma briefing in emergency situations. Someone was saying the Department of Social Development needs to be deeply involved in all these matters. It is, and it is working. Minister Zulu is working together with her staff in all matters related to this, it's not only the Ministry of Women, it's not only health, it's, it's a whole range of other government departments that are involved, police and justice and all the others. The Gender-Based Violence Command Center has been further capacitated with a new facility that can accommodate more personnel. We've been working to ensure that South Africa's efforts to turn the tide against gender-based violence are aligned with global efforts. Last year, South Africa ratified, and somebody did ask about uh, Convention 190. We ratified the International Labor Organization's Convention 190, aimed at eliminating violence and harassment in the workplace. And this is where our labor movement has played a key role in insisting and egging us on as government to ratify Convention 190. A key aspect of the National Strategic Plan is the economic empowerment of women. Since announcing our determination to direct at least 40% of public procurement to women-owned businesses, 
we have sought to establish an enabling environment to support women entrepreneurs. Now, I say an enabling environment because this is still work in progress. I firmly believe that empowering women economically empowers them so much more than you can imagine because they are then less dependent on men who abuse them. We have trained more than 6,000 women to prepare them to take up procurement opportunities. And let me tell you that the message is spreading and deepening in government that as we procure, we need to be making sure that 40% of what we procure is done through women-led businesses, women-owned businesses, as well as women-managed businesses. Now, through the Women's Economic Assembly, we have seen industry associations and companies committing to industry-wide gender transformation targets. I've been to the second Women's Assemb Economic Assembly this year, and I've been hugely impressed by the many women who are part of this assembly, who are themselves leading business women, who are getting a number of, and mobilizing and recruiting a number of companies to come behind this whole effort of empowering our women economically. We can therefore say that we've made significant progress in putting what I would call the supporting architecture in place that is critical to a coordinated and collaborative fight against gender-based violence and femicide. In the joint sitting in Parliament in 2019, I called for government departments to allocate their res uh, various resources within their departments, as I said earlier, to combat gender-based violence. As a result, in February 2021, government announced the allocation of approximately 21 billion over a three-year period to implement the various components of the National Strategic Plan. A significant portion of these funds has been committed to advancing the empowerment of women through procurement, through business support, and through access to economic opportunities for women. Funds have also been directed to expanding support to survivors, strengthening the response of the criminal justice system, and undertaking prevention programs. Now, you may not uh, recognize this very easily and quickly. But when we said, for instance, to the Department of, of Justice, set aside money to respond to the NSP, setting, allocating these courts, and I've been to some of the courts, I went to one, co one court in Boisens here in Gauteng, where a special court had been set aside for children who are victims of gender-based of, of violence to be able to testify in an environment that is conducive, where they are even able to, to demonstrate how they were violated through usage of various other, uh, not necessarily toys, but other artifacts. And that has to be specially built. And that has to be money that is allocated by that department from its own budget when we said, set aside money. And as I said, yes, we will continue to fund this fight because this is our collective fight. The Department of Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation has been tracking expenditure of this amount over the medium term. It is important that this summit does make an assessment both 
on the extent of funds that have been spent, as well as the purposes to which these funds have been put. I do want your quest for accountability to get to that point so that you are able, as citizens of our country, to see precisely whether that money has been used and to what extent it has been used. We need to ensure that our resources are being directed to exactly where there is the greatest need and where they have the greatest impact. Last year, we established a private sector-led gender-based violence and femicide response fund. Someone was asking about this fund. And this was fund one, which received a commitment of 162 million and has to date funded 112 grant partners. Now, obviously, we want more money. And one of you said, apply a 2% levy on the private sector. Now, clearly, a levy is a tax. And tax has to be crafted by Treasury. And that is a matter that has to belong to the full taxation architecture of our country. And these are matters that we will obviously want to look at. We must acknowledge, however, that given the demand for services to address the very many different challenges that we have and various aspects to fight against gender-based violence, these funds that have been put aside are hugely inadequate. And as many of you were saying, you do want your NPOs to be well capacitated because as one of you said, you are at the coal face. And I do, I do recognize that you are at the coal face. And that is where you work with government. That is where you assist government. And that's precisely the reason why we should capacitate your organizations. We should strengthen your hand because you are helping South Africans that we should fight against gender-based violence. So I do call on the private sector in particular to join hands with us as we did when we set up the Solidarity Fund to make more resources available and where they are needed most. And I will continue making this call on the private sector because gender-based violence, the scourge of gender-based violence has an economic cost and we need to reduce that cost and to make sure that we all participate in implementing the national strategic plan. This fight is about far more than ensuring that survivors of gender-based violence get justice. It is far more, much more than that. It is a plan that is meant to ensure that the women of our country regain their dignity, the women of our country do become much more economically empowered, that the women of our country do lead respectable lives. It is about preventing violence against women, no doubt. It is in the area of prevention that we need to place greater attention but also to exert more effort and dedicate more resources. And the message that you are putting out to us about resources is very clear. It's clear because we've, 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 we've put in place a very good foundation. The foundation is going to be strengthened more as we get the legislation through Parliament as we get the council off the ground and get the council to work more effectively. And I should explain and, uh, that maybe on the council issue, and we are nearing the end of the process of getting the council established. Initially, and to be honest with you, initially when the issue of the council was mooted, by yourselves, when it got to us in government, it was 
conceptualized as similar to SANAC, the National, the South African National AIDS Council. Now, SANAC works in a different way and it's structured in a different way. And somehow, the thinking was that it could be another SANAC. And the discussions went on and Treasury also said, yes, uh, it, it can be structured like, like SANAC, but you, and this is where I'm really grateful for your interventions and the interventions of the people that you have put on the team, are very important. You came back and said, no, we don't want it to be structured like SANAC. We want the this council to work effectively so that it is like the front line entity that is going to respond to gender-based violence. And, and I appreciate that. Now, indeed, having appreciated that, uh, it means that we have listened very carefully to what you have had to say, and we are going to make sure that as we finalize the legislation and as the council is put together, it will work as a very effective organ that is going to enable us to fight effectively to bring gender-based violence to an end. We have not mobilized the resources that are required for effective behavior change programs that link up the efforts of social partners in communities to address the attitudes and actions of men. In every part of society, in every workplace, in every school and college and university, in every government department, and in every municipality, we need to be organizing men's dialogues. Minister Kele here was recounting the number of men's dialogues that have been held. Now, yesterday, a day before yesterday, I was at the University of Forte, and I asked the vice chancellor, how are they responding to gender-based violence on campus? And he said, Mr. President, we're seeing a wonderful development. And I said, how come? He said, we've held men's dialogues, young men, students' dialogues, and they have gone to great length and depth to discuss issues of gender-based violence with these young men. And the message has been sinking in and the level of consciousness has been rising. And he said, the incidents that we are seeing on campus are tapering down. The next round is going to be, he told me, to hold a women's dialogue. And thereafter, they are then going to put the, the two together. And he said, it has unleashed a new energy in dealing with gender-based violence at the university. And he says, a number of young women have come forward and say, we now feel safe as we move around the campus. Which shows that we do need to reach out to boys and young men to develop masculinities that value respect, understanding, and accountability. I was, I was also exposed to another event, also in the Eastern Cape. Uh, Premier Oscar Mabuyani is here. I went to a school prize-giving ceremony, and these young boys uh, had participated in a debate, age 16, 17, and so on, grade 11, grade 12. Eight of them had won prizes. I don't remember whether it was a provincial or national debate, and I asked each one of them, what was the debate about? And they said it was on gender-based violence. Each one in their debate had handled a particular topic on gender-based violence. I was overjoyed to see that it's cascading even down at school level where young boys are now being exposed to the 
issues of gender-based violence and their consciousness is beginning to go up. Now, a good example of this is the project by Prime Stars, which in collaboration with government focuses on redefining masculinity amongst young men. This program needs to be rolled out to all schools in the country. We need to see, yes, the president, ministers, premiers, religious leaders, sports people, artists, educators, business leaders, and many others participating in various dialogues, outreach processes, and awareness raising activities. Now, I have said to my staff, I want, as I move around the country now, to find time to devote to having men's dialogues so that we can talk about gender-based violence with the men of our country. Now, I'd like to thank our premiers. Our premiers are here. I want to thank them for convening Provincial Gender-Based Violence Summit, leading up to this summit. I kept reading about it and seeing some of it on TV, and I've been hugely impressed that at provincial level, we have been holding this summit, and with today's messaging, as well as what will be discussed in your various uh, groupings, you will come up with a number of decisions and suggestions so that we continue spreading this message and certainly the provincial summits have contributed a great deal to the level of raising consciousness in our nation and making the issue of gender-based violence and femicide topical, top of mind, so that we talk and talk and talk about it so that more and more of our people in South Africa are aware of the scourge that is gender-based violence, this pandemic. We need to reweave the social fabric of our country so we become a society that is nurturing, is caring, is respectful, and in which the human rights of all are protected. Yes, even the human rights of people with albinism, as my brother was saying there, are protected, and that albinism should also be seen and recognized as a disability, as Minister Nkwana Mashabani said. We must build a society, we must also build a society in which there is no place for crimes against women, and we must spread this message, we must instill this in the, in the minds of the men of this country. That there is, this should not be a country where violence is perpetrated against women and children. And members of the LGBTQI plus community as well. As we reflect on the progress on the last four years, we can count on a number of successes. We have put the issue of violence against women and children firmly on the national agenda and at the forefront of the minds of many South Africans. You will recall that during the COVID pandemic, I made it a special effort to continue talking about gender-based violence and even dubbed it, as I said, a pandemic, a second pandemic. We have established critical institutions and mobilized significant resources, but we need to do more. But there is a lot more that we still need to do. And the lot more that we need to do should now be discussed by yourselves because you crafted the National Strategic Plan where there are gaps, where there are lapses, where there are weaknesses, we would like you to point that out, because this is a fight that we should not lose. We are not even close to where we want to be, and I'd like you to point that out more fully and firmly in your discussions. 
we are confronted with an immensely difficult task to turn the mindsets of the men of our country who are intoxicated often with their sense of masculinity, who are also intoxicated with a sense that they are superior to the women of our country, who are intoxicated with patriarchy, believing that you know, they are much more important than the women of our country. This is the task that we have on our hands. And this is a task that we need to win together. The road ahead, no doubt, will be long. It will also be challenging. But it is a road that we must walk together. Government cannot do it alone, nor can civil society do it alone. Even worse, nor can each organization do it alone. We need to be united in this fight. It is a road that we must work, walk together, but walk together with determination so that the women and the children of this country may live in safety, in peace, and in happiness. We want to do nothing less than fundamentally and forever change our society. So in the end, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, working together as we have done over these last four years, I have no doubt that we will It's a fight that we must take on. Thank you very much. Let's give him another round of applause.